Good evening and welcome to the Oasis podcast. And uh, we are back this week on a rainy evening. Well, well sunshine. Yeah, sun shining a little yeah. bit, kind of coming through, but it was wet. Good day to be a duck. And I think you said even the ducks aren't swimming today. They're walking. There's yeah, high uh, water. High water. <laughs> today was the day for those not so not so long pants, right? The high water yeah. pants. So you don't get your uh, cuffs wet when you're walking through. But mm -hmm. anyway, we're back tonight to to talk about the view through your windshield or how do you see the future? Maybe the bug on the windshield. The bug on the windshield, <laughs> or how do you view your water bottle? Is it uh, half full or half empty? Well, we figured we'll get the title by the time we're done, but mm -hmm. we do have a a train of thought that we want to talk <laughs> yeah. about. That is looking at the future, preparing for the future, but also doing that in a way that utilizes uh, your gifts and calling, your assignment from God, and and what does that look like? So it's it's a number of things rolled into one, and we couldn't quite figure out how to how to put that into into play. But uh, Wayne Weaver and I'm John Yoder, and we're here to to talk about life, preparing for the future, practical life, practical yeah. life. You know, mm -hmm. life is practical is. in yeah. so many ways. We can make it. We can overthink it. We can victimize ourselves. We can bully others. We can do a lot of things, but life at its basic is is fairly simple and practical. Mm -hmm. two, and feet, two feet. Two hands. Two ears. I remember, two eyes. remember one fellow that uh, I worked with for a while, just got out of prison and, and he didn't have a license or anything, was living in the city of Saskatoon. And I'd ask him, well, man, how did you get over there to do a job interview? Oh, two feet and a heartbeat, he said. So <laughs> anyway, that was his, yep. his mode of transportation. But um, anyway, we're glad you're with us tonight. And as you um, listen in, if you like what you're hearing, please hit the like button, subscribe to the, the channel, um, hit that notification bell because we may pull a fast one sometime and do one you're not expecting. And you're not, you're not going to want to miss those. Um, and also send us your comments to library at oasistabernacle.org. We do like to hear your comments. Uh, we have, we've got a couple of questions that came in that we'll probably respond to via email rather than on the air, but um, certainly glad to hear your questions and comments and feel free to share those with us. Uh, now, Wayne, recently um, I saw an article that was written and that it really kind of the, the title grabbed me and it says, why are people so down on the future? And I was kind of reflecting on that a little bit. And along with this article, or in this article, very early on, uh, the the author had, or the writer had a, a diagram or a chart that showed most of the major nations in the world. And it basically 65% of the world thinks their governments are going in the wrong direction. I thought that's kind of fascinating. Um, so there's there's not a really positive outlook on on life and the way things are going. People are scared. People are looking around. They're not liking what it looks like their prospects are. They maybe don't even like where they are. And we want to talk about that tonight. What are the things that a, a Christian should focus on as we look at life and preparing for the future, looking at the future? Um, we, we can all look at the past, but most of us, if we have life left, are looking at a future as well. How, how do we prepare for that in a practical way? And I know that there are different things we can look at in Scripture regarding our possessions and regarding preparations. And, and some people look at life and say, well, we shouldn't care about anything. Jesus says, take no thought for the morrow. The next person says, no, we're, we're supposed to be following the principles we learn in Proverbs. You know, the prudent man looks well to his going. And, and, um, and the other one says, the prudent foresees the trouble and he hides himself mm -hmm. and he prepares for it. So there are these different, um, different ideas out there. And then most people kind of fall into that spectrum between doing nothing and really doing well. So 
how do we look at the future? We've talked about this in a variety of ways, but I, I want to start with John 6, 27, and then also Matthew, a um, uh, passage out of Matthew and Luke, just to start with. And that, that'll, you might decide to launch out somewhere else, but I want to read these just mm-hmm. as a, a pattern. Mm-hmm. So John six twenty seven says this, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So that's, that's one of those passages that really is kind of foundational. It's, it's giving us the temporal and the eternal. And I don't think he's telling us that we shouldn't prepare at all for the food that perishes. But what is our prime goal in life? And that is the eternal. And then in Matthew six twenty five and 26, uh, Jesus is speaking about these things again, and he's speaking in it uh, in terms of not being anxious. We've got a lot of people mm-hmm. with anxiety today, but when he when he speaks this, he's not saying sit down and do nothing. He's saying don't be anxious, don't be fearful. But that doesn't mean do nothing. And I think sometimes people say, "Oh, okay." God's going to take care of me. I don't need to do anything. But this is what he says. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And then he has a very similar passage, um, and Luke records a very similar thing in Luke 12, 31 to 34. And I'm going to read the tail end of that because it kind of dovetails in. It says, but seek the kingdom of God and all these things, what we're going to eat, drink, and all of those things will be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. All right, so using those passages that I've just read as kind of a backdrop as we talk about gifts and callings and looking toward the future, I think the tendency is to be anxious. These passages, I believe, primarily speak about not being anxious not fretting about these things, but I don't think it's talking about don't make good investments, don't plan well, and don't structure well. Now, you have been probably like the Apostle Paul. You've learned what it was to be in want, and you've learned what it is to be in plenty, and you've learned to be content in both of those things. But plenty doesn't necessarily just come by sitting on your thumbs. And... um, So when we look at the future, when we look at all of these things, what is is a Christian? How should a Christian, how should a person in general prepare for the future and have a fulfilling life? There's a lot of thoughts went through my mind when the second to the last verse that you read, I had a thought when you were reading that, and then then the next verse came, so I'm not (laughs) sure that my first thought fled. But part of, um, okay, so the Bible teaches us some things about uh, making wise decisions and also to uh, uh, be good stewards and so forth. There's there's a balance of all those teachings. And I think here's here's the thing. We don't want to worry about tomorrow, no, but... One of the one of the ways, and I know some people would get pretty ugly about this, maybe on this statement, but we don't want to worry about tomorrow. We talk about not worrying about tomorrow, but there is a part of something that we can do that will also diminish that worry, and that's making right decisions. And that's very important. It is. It's part of wisdom. Mm-hmm. It's part of being loyal to what God has given us and to be good stewards. And and I would, I think, I would like to speak more on the stewardship line of abilities, gifts, and, and callings, and so forth, than I would on the dollar bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, because ultimately, that's the way I see it. The foundation of all that is abilities and gifts that God has given us. And if we don't function in what he has given us, of course, 
the end result of that is we will have great lacks. And many people find that out only as they go through life and come to the close of it. And then they see where they've really missed it. Can't really turn around, can't really do anything anymore. And I, There's I nothing think, really to work with no, now. No, and I would like to, I think we need to spend some time on talking about that because I, down through the years I've seen that was one of the great mistakes that I have run across over and over and over in people's lives. And they want to trust God with everything. And it's like trusting God with the boat you're sitting in and with the oars that you have in your hand. However, there's only one problem. You're out in a farmer's field, not on the, on the water. You're, you've got your boat in the wrong place. You've got your oars in the wrong place. And, or you're trying to seed corn out on the water. You know, there's there's right way to do things, and, and we can expect what we put in the ground, not in the water. You know, the Bible does say that we can also cast our bread on the water, and it will return. Uh, there's different ways of doing all this, and, and I think we need to talk about some of that, because uh, I'll just be very clear with you on this, is down through the years, way too many people wake up when it's way too late. And then what they become is not people that are really stewards of faith, but they become bitter, mm -hmm. and they start blaming everything else for it and end up being just in a constant defeat in their lives and, and question, why does God not take care of them? Well, maybe you need to back up a lot. Maybe you need to look at wh where have you been all these years? God has given you ability. God has given you gifts. And I think discerning some of those gifts mm -hmm. is, is what I'd really like to speak about sometime here. Well, and, and this is, that's, that's interesting. And I think we can go there because as we were talking about uh, some of these things, we talked about what makes people look at the future. There are some people today who are at a point where maybe because of their age or their health, mm -hmm. suddenly they're looking back and saying, what have I done with my yeah. life? Mm -hmm. And at this point, it's either saying, what have I done with my life? Is there anything to be salvaged? Or I can look at it and say, I've been given a raw deal. God hasn't taken care of me. Mm -hmm. But in Matthew 25, Jesus gave a number of parables. Mm -hmm. But one of them that he gave was about a master who had... Mm -hmm three servants. I'm sure he had mm -hmm. more, but we, for the sake of the story, Simple. Jesus spoke of the three, and, and one he gave five talents, the other he gave two, and one, and then the, the last one he gave one. And now, now let's just stop right there for a little bit. Now, to some people, that's not fair. All right? So, to some people, that's not mm -hmm. fair. So to one he gave what? Five? Five. The other one he gave what? Two. Two, and the other one he gave one. One. So the one person with a one would feel that that's not fair. I only have this one ability that I actually have. But continue to read. Well, and, and the way the story goes is the, the, the master leaves, and, and then he comes back. In the meantime, the one that had the five went out and actually, through investment or work, developed another five. The one with two did the same thing and doubled his his holdings. Mm -hmm. The one that only had the one, and I say only because that was the way he looked at it. He didn't look at it as a gift mm -hmm. or as a trust. He just said, oh, what can I do with this? And so he buried it until the master came home. He said, I'll just give him back what he owes. But along with it came a bit of an attitude. I knew yep. you, I knew you were a mm -hmm. hard master. Mm -hmm. And Not part fair. of that is probably because I only got one. So I'm saying, look, if you're only going to give me one, you're only going to get one back. I don't know. Who knows how he thought mm -hmm. of that? We can speculate on those things. But I want to read what Jesus says uh, uh, the master did as he comes back. And I want to read the one, uh, what he said to the one with the five talents. And then he said something very similar to the two. And then I want to read what he said to the one. Mm -hmm. Um, so Matthew 25, 20 to 21. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well, then you have the gentleman that brought the one talent 
mm-hmm. dug it back up and brought it, and he says, in Matthew 25, 25, he says, I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, you have what is yours. I'm giving it back. Mm-hmm. Those were the two things. And, of course, the, the response to that servant was a harsh rebuke and judgment. Um, yeah. What do we do with that? Talents, gifts, callings from God, and managing those, using those, understanding what they are. But that's quite a story. It's quite a story, and it applies so very well if we understand it correctly. And I know, and I'd like to give some incidents incidents, um, in my own life concerning that, because I remember running across that verse, um, yeah, when I was quite young, and thinking that, well, you know, five, two, one, (laughs) I don't even know that I have one. I don't, I don't even know that I have one gift or one talent. And, and, and truly, I was at a place like that. And, I mean, I wasn't good at anything I was doing, uh, except maybe uh, some sports I was pretty good at, but I saw no future in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, not enough to carry me into a future. And I think that's part of taking care of your talent as well, is, is you might have something, but it will not do anything for your future. Why waste your time on it? And uh, I see this sometimes with people that they push their children maybe to do things that is not natural for the children even. They'd rather do some, something else. And so you push them and you just push them into rebellion. And, and then later on in life, there's really nothing that can benefit the kingdom in it. That I see. And, but the, but if, if I can say this, I know that I was told at a very young age that you know, from even my superior, uh, I don't really want to just name it, mm-hmm. but a uh, superior that um, had a responsibility over me is that I'm a person of no gift, no talents. And in my heart, I could have soured and I could have gone that route and always blame, you know, well, others, you know, I was not good in school. All my my brothers were better in school. The one right below me was a uh, grade A student. I was almost a grade F student, straight F student. <laughs> and and uh, it, it was just, yeah. And But then when you look at what has changed in my life, that, that whole picture has totally changed. And, and I became somebody. And, and, and I'll say two things. One thing is that when the Holy Spirit came into my life in a very real way, then I noticed that he deposited some things in my heart that I never had before, all right? It was not in a profound way. It wasn't a prof- profound way that happened, but it was almost as I discovered that there are some things in my heart that are in there. And I think the Holy Spirit allowed me to, because he searches all things, he saw some seeds in my heart, and he and he brought this into caused it to prosper brought it up and yeah. to brought it up to where I could see it and and I I know for years um, that I said that the only gift then or talent that I would have uh, would be to run heavy equipment you know and my wife would tell me this because she used to hear obviously that I'm just no good at anything I do I just am not but for some reason running through levers in some of the hardest equipment to run I was really good at it and I was known for it And it was easy, and it is even that way to this day. Um, Well, so my thing is, well, how can that be a spiritual gift? Is it a spiritual gift? No, perhaps not. But it doesn't really say spiritual gift. It says gifts and callings. Uh, I do believe that there is gifts and callings that do come from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But then I also believe we have natural abilities that God has given and has imputed to us And it can be through the mixture of DNA that we have through generations, some of the beauty of how God creates people, develops people. And so it is to find what that is that is in you. And and I'll I'll take you, for example, oh my goodness, I I can go along on these things. But I had a a very big project in the early years of my my life. I had a, a, a bid on a big project. Uh, that uh, could have lost everything I had, 
and not perform properly. It was a heavy, um, heavy construction project that I had in the excavating line. And uh, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I just don't know. I, I'm just not, I'm not educated. I can, I can operate levers and that's about it. But I thought, well, at least it's a gift. And if I can take this gift and make something out of it, there I can prosper then. So I recognize that I can prosper in the gift that God has given me, whether it's in my natural ability or even a spiritual gift that he gave me. Those were two options. This was in my natural ability because when I was still carnal, I was already good at that. Well, so what happened is I did this job. It was a big, very big job, and I did it in record time. Uh, in, in, in every phase of it, I had the, the highest score. I was actually the Dodds report. They were there every day to tally er, all my improvement, everything I did every day. Uh, you know, every, they, they watched every move, ground, dirt compaction, everything. And I came in as one of the highest rated one in the state of Ohio. And as a result, many doors opened to go that route. Well, and I'm, I'm not going to go further on that, but I'll say this. I walked away from that job, and I made some money on it. It was not a dramatic amount. Maybe back in that time it was good, but this is what I made. This is what I did. I walked away, and I said, huh, I can do it. It was a confidence builder. Mm -hmm. And I saw that once I have confidence in something, that springs an ability in me that I can take the ability that I have and cause it to work if I have confidence. And I think that is a very key part in how many people do not properly uh, use their gift or their, ca their talent is because they have no confidence. And I, I think that is so key. When I, when I look back to what you said about being a young boy— uh, failing school, hearing that you've got no talents. Um, when you looked ahead at that point in your life, what did you see? And I think maybe there are people out here today who are looking at this and they're saying, for what I see in my future, I don't have what it takes. Mm -hmm. I am too dumb, uh, too. Mm -hmm. un I can't, What yeah. there's no market for what I like to do or whatever. Mm -hmm. What did you, when you looked ahead, what did you see? Well, I mean, I saw a solid wall of I will be very below average person. And I thought, well, if I could have a good job, at least come to a place where I can have a really good job. And I noticed then we had a skid steer that my father bought and used it on the farm. I was a farmer. And, and I was really good at it, very quick, very quick at it. And, and even some construction people back then, skid steers were somewhat new. And they even remarked and complimented how good he is and how quick and how smooth he is on that machine. That, that machine just, he doesn't have to work. Machine does all that work. It just, it just works. And I noticed that. And, and it's like, and so I noticed, again, little confidence. And I saw that, you know, this is something that I'm here, even hearing that I'm pretty good at. And so I decided, you know what? There's other things in this line of doings. And I started developing an interest in what is known as heavy equipment. And in the evenings, when I'm done with the chores, I would uh, ride on my bike, sometimes 10 miles one way, not e-bikes, through the hills, to go to some of the coal hills and just sit there until dark to watch the moving of equipment, how they worked, you know, they worked night shifts. And I listened to the sound and I watched the dirt and I was like, and they knew me, even the operators knew me, that's that little boy. And, and I was so intrigued by it. So I started pursuing that which I thought might be a gift that I have or could develop. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the whole thing, I really think, again, I can't stress enough, is the confidence thing. I think there's a lot of people that would do some other things, but they just don't have confidence. And I think the thing about finding confidence is, is if you find a functioning gift that you have, one other gift that I had from we young up, I used to, that's one of the reasons I wasn't all that great in school is I was an artist. I'd sit there and just draw. I'd draw somebody in school sitting there and it looked like him. And and so I thought, well, later on in life, uh, 
And I would pursue these things of my interest, uh, sit at home and just draw pictures and draw and draw and draw. That's how I met my wife eventually. And she was also an artist. Well, there was a local artist by the name of Tom Miller that was quite popular, and he was doing a mural in our area. And any little chance that I had, even if, if I had a lunch break, a little, I'd walk over there really quick and sit there and just watch him, watch him, watch him. And, and, but I was pursuing some of my interests that I had. And I saw that there is a possibility I could do this as well. In fact, I looked at some of the perspective on some of his pictures, and I thought, I think I could even probably do better. And I probably could have. Well, that intrigued me. But then it hit me that there is no, there are no artists that really have much uh, in this life as far as money and so forth to live. And they normally, their values increase after they die. All right, so I carried that on, and all at once, I came to a place where I, well, art, art, well, what else can I do? You know what? Art, just by drawing a picture and painting a picture, is a form of art. But, you know, developing and crafting something out of wood and designing things, that's also artistic. Mm -hmm. So work on that. There, that is proven to have some you can you can get somewhere in life. Mm -hmm. That's how Weaver Furniture started. I decided I'm going to practice this skill that I did not acquire. It was just you know from making marks on a paper, and I've learned to perfect it to designing things. To today mm -hmm. is is I have a furniture store as a result of that, and not only that, some of the other company things that I have, some of the artistics that I used in the development of of you know, uh, buildings and so forth. Uh, yeah, we're still a forerunner of all that. I, we kind of get a kick out of it. The, the, we rarely, rarely uh, see something new on the market that didn't come from us to begin with because we have people that are constantly watching our designs and everything, so they copy. And there's some people that do well in copying. I like to be the ones that develop it, and our companies have learned to do that. So we're always like a step ahead. And if you want to know if you're uh, leading, uh, is if, you're the, if they're all following you, then you must be leading. And that's typically the way we have all our companies. <laughs> well, and that's, that's interesting because you're, you're saying something that leads into another question I had here. So when you look ahead, what do you see? And you talked about seeing that, that wall, um, but also noticing things that you were good at. And mm -hmm. some ways, the praise of other farmers looking on and saying, yeah. hey, he runs that thing well. Mm -hmm. But what influences your decisions? I think that's something else people need to understand. When you look ahead and, see what, and look at the yeah. future, what do you see? Mm -hmm. But then what influences your decisions? Mm -hmm. What makes you think the bottle is, or, or the, the, the water bottle is mm -hmm. half full or, or half empty? What well, influences those decisions? What mm -hmm. influenced you? Yeah, well, okay, we, we use the word success. All right. So some people would look at me and say that he's successful. What is what define the word success? The way I define it is simply to succeed. If you succeed in something, you're successful. I mean, that can be whatever you, you have your choice. If you could, it could be the project, you, it could be the picture, yeah, it can be yeah. the furniture, it yeah. can be yeah. And there is something about succeeding that stimulates a person. It stimulates uh, ability. It stimulates um, activity, um, perspective, um, dreams, visions. It, it, it stimulates that. And if you're constantly in defeat, well, it, you know, you look at the news, you feel like selling everything you have and just, just this world's going to pot. And then we have all these people that are Sell everything saying you the have and go, yeah. go hunker down in a bunker yeah, somewhere. And, 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 yeah, yeah and, and, and go and, and put it all in a box. And then when the master comes, give him that. He said, this, here is yours. No, I, 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 I don't believe in that. I, I believe in not what the economy does to me, but helping the economy do what it needs to. Well, and I think you mentioned something there. Success is succeeding. It's accomplishing something. I, I was amazed at how many inmates, as I've worked over the years, how many of them on completing a no, Bible? No, you were not in prison. No. You worked as I, a missionary to prisoners. I worked as prisoners. a missionary, yeah, yes, as a chaplain. Get right, yeah, get yeah. that right. <laughs> I didn't ever have a state number, no, yeah. or a federal number. Yeah. Um, or an but one shirt. of the things, or an orange jumpsuit. I don't think I've ever had one of those. Uh, but... One of the things that many 
inmates would say on accomplishing a Bible study is they would say, this is the first thing I have ever completed in my life. Wow. That's I think, a statement. That's a really good is. statement. Yeah. But I think that for so many people, they never really quite know the joy of completing mm-hmm. something. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. it's never quite finished, or yeah. it's, it's it's not always su- they're not successful mm-hmm. in it. Yeah. I, I really like yeah. that what you said. It mm-hmm. it's actually success is yeah. succeeding. succeeding. It is accomplishing mm-hmm. finishing something. Yeah. Expectations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you expect bigger, you expect more. The the problem with a lot of people in this is they never you know, it's like <sighs> It's like, why didn't I know this, these things when I was young? Yeah, well, I try my best to promote this, to make sure people are aware of what I'm saying about these things. And I've tried to inspire many people with not thinking the way I did when I was young or not ever been taught this way. And, you know, I've been ridiculed for it as well. But I think it's important because there, we've got way too many people in the, uh, dotting around in the wilderness not knowing where they're at. The other thing is you cannot be lazy. And I could say that a thousand times. You cannot be lazy. There is, and, and what, what promotes laziness? It's uh, laziness is when you look at a mountain, you see, I can't climb it anyway, so I'll just sit here. There is something that inspires, uh, inspires you to do the impossible. And, and some of that is, again, the succeeding thing. If mm-hmm. you have never succeeded in anything, you'll just be like a doldrum of some sort, just sitting around and wasting your time and and kind of feeding that I'll never get anywhere in life and I'll always be disappointed at everything. And so what happens, you start looking at things you can find fault in. And that's where you capitalize on that. And that is not going the right direction. What, what you need to do is get your head out of the sand and get your head out of that and see perspective in life that... Number one, with God, all things are possible. God will help me if I make a choice. And here's the other thing. Most people are not willing to risk anything. Many people don't like to make any changes. They like to live in their little secure area, and and that's fine. But don't complain about it. That's fine. Don't complain about it. And don't think that God one day will come down the road with a wheelbarrow, and he'll dump a whole wheelbarrow of money in your yard. No, no, that wheelbarrow was something that you could have filled as you were making proper decisions in life as you were growing up, and all we all had that opportunity. And, and I'll say this amongst all that, I had the least of opportunity in that. Um, I was not given money from my, my parents or anything to make me successful. The most I got, remember, was my dad once passed out $1,000 to all the children. That was, that was huge. And that's what we got. And then when they died, of course, we had some inheritance, but it was not a big amount. It didn't change anything in our lives. And so so uh, you cannot be lazy and you cannot be, you know, you can't come home from work in the evening and, and just can't wait to hit the chair and sit there and, and basically, you know, pout. Everybody is, has it better than I know. You need to get a hold of yourself. And, 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 and the thing about it is allow God to search your heart to see what is a gift mm-hmm. or something. Because I believe God, God puts callings on gifts. If you have a gift and you sense a gift, often the callings that God uses, even when you're spiritually baptized with the Holy Spirit, he takes the gift that you naturally have and often puts his calling on top of that. And that's, what's, that what, that's what will carry you somewhere. And whether that is being in the missionary, being a pastor, being a steward in the church, being a pillar in the church, and all those things, whatever that is, be the best of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, succeed in it. Find something to succeed in. And and find something to accomplish, because I think when you accomplish accomplish things, uh, there is a momentum that comes with finishing one project and looking at the next. Yeah. And I think that there is, uh, a lot of times, people never get that momentum. You you even look at a ball game, a carnal ball game, all right? And all at once, the momentum swings, or a a football or some of the other sports, as soon as the momentum swings a little bit, it even, it just, it puts something in everyone, and now now they really hit the ball, now they win. Mm Mm-hmm. 
And winning is part of that. It is, it is, there's a momentum, but you have to be able to have it yourself. You, you have to be able to create that yourself and to be inspired and moved by it. Mm -hmm. It's the way it works. And I even find the Holy Spirit in the preaching of it, that in revival meetings, normally you see God move, you know, can't the first night, second night, but as it goes on, all at once there's momentum. And all at once, and I ask you, and I ask the listeners, have you ever seen any of that momentum in your life? You know, and when that momentum stops, and, and I'll tell you, that's another problem. You get to a certain age of retirement, all that, and all at once, momentum is something you cannot, uh, it's like, the, it's like the, the natural adrenaline or the spiritual adrenaline of your life. You have to kind of learn to replace it with something that you can go through difficult times until you find yourself. But I, I really, I, I, re, I really think people, uh, uh, if, if you're listening, and I, I, I'm sure we have some mothers sitting at home that are saying, well, what can I do? You know, I'm, I take care of diapers every day and I, I do this and I'm not getting anywhere. Oh my goodness, but you can start planting seeds in those little children you have around you all day long. And those seeds will inspire later on in life where you can see your children do what I'm talking about. That is a tremendously powerful tool. Mm -hmm. that you can have to inspire your children for that. Well, and I think that's one of the more important uh, things, uh, jobs that we can we can have actually is shaping uh, eternal souls mm -hmm. um, and, and shaping souls. I mean, like, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, whole, the whole concept of arrows in the hands of a mighty yeah. warrior, well, those are being shaped and ready. The whole idea of an arrow is to send it out. And if, if you are shaping these children in a home yeah. and getting them ready to send out... Mm -hmm. What kind of life skills are you teaching them? Yeah. Um, you hey, know. man, do things that are valuable to the spiritual man. Yeah. Something that's valuable to the kingdom. And, and yeah, I mean, there's some things that you can, that are foundational, perhaps, in learning discipline and things of this nature in some forms that can be an enhancement of the future. But uh, that's not necessarily the thing that all young people have interest in. Mm -hmm. That comes with the territory. Uh, I, I just I and, and take interest in your children. Yeah. Know what they liked, and and don't try to teach them if, if they like a certain thing as really young. Don't try. I say like this: you you will be a successful parent if you can steer their gifts and their callings or what they like. If you can steer that. Now, if you want a conflict, then try to persuade them different and get them out of that. Yeah. But steer. You can you have steering power. Tremendous parents have tremendous steering power. And if they would only work on their children to do steering rather than trying to put roadblocks in front of them all the time and or make them do things that they have no interest in. Well, and I think that's a big key because you you talked about your life seeing things that were a gift in you, things that you enjoyed and things that came natural. Quite often people look around to see what's popular with others, what gets other people yeah. praised. And then they try to do mm. that, and it may not even mm. be them. It, yeah. You know, I, I feel so bad when I see someone who's trying so hard to work in a, an industry or a, a field of something, and you're like, you know mm. what, that's not you. Mm -hmm. what, what are you doing here? Amen. Well, that's what was popular. Mm -hmm. That's what seems to gain the, mm -hmm. you know, and so you want to get in on it. But if it's mm -hmm. not you, if that's not the gifting that God has given you, and if that's not the calling that God has placed on your life, you're going to be very frustrated trying to push through this thing to yeah. be a, as successful as the person who has that gift. Yeah. And some of those things can also be competition. Competition to some people really inspires them. You know, Motivates it, them. Yeah, motivates and inspires them. You know, he's doing this, I can do it better. Or even in business. Well, if he can do that, I know I could do better. That's not a healthy thing to pursue. We don't do things because we try to outdo other people. That's not, that's not, what, that's not a good motivation. That will be a motivation that you become very selfish in and eventually you'll fall flat on your face. That's not a good principle to build on. But, and I'll give you this example, and I think I once spoke about this, and I'm going out on a limb to say this. Some people will, yeah, will interpret it different, but that's up to them. I'll, I'll say it anyways because it's practical. I came to a place in my life where I, I thought, you know what? I would have some time to do some more things, and I'm not sure what to do. 
and I dote around a little bit. Do I? What, now wait what, a minute. You yeah, said yeah. you came to a time in your life where you said, "I've got time to do more things." Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Always. Okay. I, always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Sorry yeah, for always. interrupting there. It's oh, yeah. kind of an yeah. interesting statement. Yeah. I, and I look at a, a, maybe a project. I could do a project and, and, and do something. So I've always said I'll, I want to start a coffee shop sometime when I do have, when I find a little space where I could develop something and do it properly and all that. And, and I could take a year out of my schedule kind of to run it and be there and do the foundation. And that's what I did. That's how the coffee shop started, uh, Wallhouse Coffee. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing is that I thought, you know, I came to a place then after that. So what, what I do then is I put managers in to run them and so that I'm out of the picture. So that gives me more time. Well, I'm a full-time pastor in church, yeah, but I'm self-supporting. I've always been. And so so what do I do? I find little, I, I just find little things to do here and there. And so this was just several years ago, several years ago, I, I thought, you know, what is something I could do? I, I'd have some time to do this, and I'm, I might do it maybe a little bit as a hobby, but I have this belief in my heart that if I have something, it has to pay for itself, all right? So if I buy a, a, bull, a dozer, a bulldozer, if I buy a bulldozer, all right, that's good, buy it, it's a toy for you then, like it, enjoy it, but then it has to pay for itself. So I thought, you know what? Based on this, I'm good with my hands on levers, and I know how to grate things. I know, I know how water flows. I know leveling. I know grading, final grades, and all this. And I thought, you know, I do know that I do have this old natural gift that I had of operating heavy equipment. I thought, well, you know what? If I would take, if, if I just buy a piece of equipment, all right, buy a piece of equipment, and all right, and, and, and this is years ago I used to do this. And then I sold everything because I felt God turning my direction. But I always said it, and when I get older, and I'm not there yet, I'm not older, mm -hmm. but, but you know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, my hair white, I, I can't say much. But I said, I would always like to buy some equipment and just play with it a little bit. Well, but me is it has to pay for itself. So what I did is, is based on this conviction, I said, all right, so I'm going to buy this piece of land. I'm going to buy a dozer. So I did. Bought a dozer. And I'm going to buy a piece of land then. So I bought it, waited until it was right. Bought a piece of land. Now all you need to do is exercise that gift that you have. What is it? Running heavy equipment. Only in your spare time. So I bought a dozer. Bought a traco. And, and some people would say, well, I, I don't have money for any of that. Well, remember, I waited many years. This was just in the last, what, eight, ten years. Right. So it's not that I... Yeah. Knowing how important yeah. right timing is and it, accomplishing right actions is very important. Exactly. And it's it's out there in the picture. Mm -hmm. All right? So you work toward it. And so I decided, you know what, this is a gift. Lord, you've given me this gift. It's a natural gift. I can do it. So I want to produce yet something yet in this natural gift and not be slothful. And that's exactly what I did. Just a simple moment one day, I was sitting in my chair... And I thought this through, and I thought, and also there's tax advantages mm -hmm. by doing this. So I thought, you know what, this is what I'll do. I felt clear based on it's a natural gift. And if I go and, and take this talent and double it, you know, I can, I'll, it's the principle that works and God blesses it. So I did. I went and I bought land and I bought land for, um, uh, Mm, I think it was, what, 16,000 an acre. It was ridiculously expensive back then. And I, and I took the dozer and moved my levers on it and reshaped that all and end up the last, the, the highest, uh, uh, the last piece of acreage. It was numerous acres. Um, from 17,000, I was getting 70,000 an acre, all by moving my hands and living the principle of taking this talent and doing what God has asked me to do with it. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I'm saying that is for this. What is that which you have in your hands? Mm -hmm. There is this thing. Listen to this one. Wasn't it the disciples that came to the gate called Beautiful? And there, there's a man that sat there, and uh, he was wanting money. 
The disciples said like this. They said, silver and gold have I none. But what I have. But such as I have, yeah. Now I ask you the question, what do you have? What do you have? That's the thought, I believe, that inspired Smith Wigglesworth. Mm -hmm. What do you have? And that's, that's so important. And I think for everybody listening, as, as you look at the future and you, you put the headlines aside and you put these things, what has God placed in your hands? What do you have mm -hmm. that he intends you to use for his glory? And, and I'm not talking about just ministry. I'm talking about practical things. Mm -hmm. as, as you look at this and you're saying, well, I don't know. I mean, is it any point? Yeah, it is. If God's placed it there, do it. What do you have? Mm -hmm. Take that which you have. And all they did is, we have Jesus. So he put his hand out and said, Rise up and walk. Rise and walk. And he did. So he had that. Many people have things they never uncover because they don't trust it. It's there. What do you have? Mm hmm and that's Take a great all, place. Yeah. That's a great place to end our... Yeah. We're, we're yeah. over time tonight. Oh, we're over time, yep. So uh, what do you have? And you were yep. going to say, take it and do it. So yep. you finished with that thought, and that'll be our closing yep. remarks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Have a great Amen. evening.